model, in particular in the supersymmetric extensions. And if there is any supersymmetry in, at, at, the low, at low scale in the world, Marcella will be the one to figure it out first because she is <laughs> really so much in touch with, with experiment and, and understanding what's going on on both sides of the theory and experiment. So today she's going to review the, uh, the status of uh, the supersymmetric extension of standard model as I understand. Right? Kind, of. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Something. I would Do I have a, a, a pointer? A pointer, yes. It's this one, okay. Okay, good afternoon. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, I will try to do my best to, to give you a flavor of um, uh, the Higgs boson discovery and what's next. And so um, I may be part of, of this is uh, very uh, simple for, for you guys. So I will try to do the balance the best way I, I can. Uh, okay, so um, as you all know, uh, 4th of July uh, 2012, uh, we have uh, great fireworks and uh, uh, the previous was an event from CMS, but this is an event from ATLAS, um, to electrons to muons, uh, was the discovery of a, a new type of particle that we had never seen before and uh, was a discovery of a new type of force. Uh, that basically um, is proportional to mass. Um, and so this was the start of a new era for uh, particle physics and cosmology. So, um, as you know, uh, this discovery was possible at the Large Hadron Collider, LHC at CERN, uh, which uh, ran for two years at uh, a proton-proton machine. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, Geneva and, uh, and um, uh, France. And uh, this is Mont Blanc uh, there in the back. And whenever I look at this uh, build, the thing I think about is that I broke my knee there, skiing, but okay, besides that, everything is great. And so uh, this is a 17-mile uh, long pipe, uh, 300 feet underground, where you collide uh, protons uh, against protons at the center of mass energy of uh, 8 uh, tera electron volts. And so um, this machine uh, is the most expensive and most complicated and uh, most ambitious machine ever built by, by mankind. And so um, we have here something like uh, in 2011, 2012, about uh, 400 million collisions per second. And uh, um, in all these, we only produce about uh, 600,000 uh, Higgs. So the Higgs are very rare. Um, so how do we look at this? Well, we look at these uh, uh, collisions um, uh, that are, you know, this amount of collisions per second with very powerful detectors. Uh, and detectors really are just take, uh, uh, are, are like uh, cameras taking pictures, but they are very special cameras. They take 20 million pictures per second, and they're three-dimensional pictures. So they are really huge, complex objects with cutting-edge technology. And as a theorist, I am always amazed that these things work. Uh, but they do. So this is the ATLAS detector. Uh, this is uh, here, you see, that is uh, um, actually about six story high. So this is a gentleman there. Uh, and uh, it's as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. Uh, the other detector that is CMS is twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. And so this is uh, a collaboration, the Atlas experiment is a collaboration with about 3,000 physicists uh, and 174 institutions and about 40 countries around the world. So it's a truly international endeavor. And uh, of course, the NYU group uh, has done uh, a lot of uh, important contributions um, to um, what came as outcome from the Higgs discovery in a Atlas detector. So this is the CMS detector, the little one. Uh, so it's a compact, which means it's half the size of Atlas and twice the weight. And again, uh, about the same amount of, of people involved. So altogether, there are about 6,000 physicists um, involved in this. Um, so this is uh, uh, just to show that um, US uh, plays a leading role in LHC discovery. 
uh, CMS is one third uh, of, uh, of US contributions, so it's the largest contingent. So there are 40 countries, but US plays a really, really leading role. And uh, in Atlas is one fifth, and uh, they play uh, uh, leadership roles. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, Kyle uh, here is uh, actually playing a leading role in the, as convener of the US side of the uh, Higgs um, group, correct? Well, here I think he was, uh, um, uh, this is the grass Tyson, no? So you, I don't know what you were doing there, but probably were not uh, searching for the Higgs, or yes. <laughs> celebrating, yeah, celebrating the discovery. I thought it was a cute picture of you. <laughs> anyway, so now getting uh, more serious. Um, so uh, as, wow, uh, as you know, as I said, the 4th of July, the Higgs really made uh, the front page of uh, all the uh, newspapers and uh, even here in your local newspaper you had uh, some uh, um, uh, news about the discovery of the Higgs and what happened at CERN and uh, indeed the 2012-2013 has been a revolutionary year for physics and uh, just uh, 10 days ago uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for Physics 2013 uh, went to uh, Mr. Higgs and uh, Mr. Englert, and so I, I like these pictures because I think it has to do with the personality of the two people, uh, Belgium and, and British, uh, as much as I know them, that I don't know them so much personally, but okay. So, this is kind of the um, introduction. Let's now uh, try to go into why is the Higgs so important, okay, uh, for us. Uh, well, these are all the subatomic particles of what we call the standard model of particle physics. And so um, these, all these particles, uh, besides the Higgs up to last year, uh, had been seen uh, and produced at laboratories. They all have very different masses. The top quark is 172 times uh, the mass of the proton, 172 GB. Uh, the electron is uh, 10 to the 5 times smaller, for example. And uh, so um, the important question here is what causes these particles to have mass? So uh, the standard model is a quantum field theory uh, that describes all the known, uh, um, all, all, the, all the, inter the interactions uh, in, among fundamental particles that include the weak, uh, the strong, and the electromagnetic forces. And it has been tested at many colliders from, you know, uh, around the world, uh, SLAC at LEP, uh, at SLC at LEP, at Tevatron in Chicago, uh, in my backyard, and, and now at LHC. Uh, at very, very high level of precision. Um, in fact, uh, the standard model, uh, there are gauge fields. So the standard model is actually a quantum gauge field theory. And the symmetry group is SU, SU3 of color, uh, SU2 left cross U1. So this is the strong interactions. This is the uh, uh, electroweak interactions. Okay, And we have here the matter fields. They are uh, three families of quarks and three families of leptons. Uh, that have all the same quantum numbers under these uh, symmetry groups. And uh, um, the, the quarks uh, see the strong interactions, see color. Uh, the leptons uh, only see the electroweak interactions. And also, uh, the important part is that uh, the, the weak interactions, as uh, we will see, um, interact differently with left handed versus right handed uh, fermions, correct? So left-handed defining like uh, op the, the spin direction of the, of the fermion is opposite to the propagation direction. And then besides the matter uh, particles, they are also the uh, force carriers that are actually the, the, the ones that mediate uh, these uh, gauge interactions. And we have 12 fundamental fields, uh, eight gluons, so basically associated to the generators of these groups, so a generator for SU3, three generators for SU2, which are these uh, three W mu, and one generator for the abelian U1, which is this B mu. Of course, as we will see, this, this group is, uh, is broken, and at the end, the mass eigenstates states are what we have here, the gluon, the photon, the W, and the C. So um, the idea is that the weak interactions, uh, well, first of all, the idea of weak interactions was first postulated to explain uh, beta decay or decaying of, of uh, 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 transforming a neutron into a proton and emitting an electron. And so uh, the, the weak interactions are, are short interactions. They are only 
really uh, um, valid inside uh, the nucleus. And uh, what they do, their range is order one over the mass of the W square. So what it means that they are short range is they mean that they demand massive force carriers. So the W and the C has to be massive, and the, f the force goes like, so it's, it's dumped uh, with E to the minus MW. So the W mass was measured to be of the order of 80 uh, GV, 80 times the mass of the proton, and it's very relevant, this value, to determine the strength and the range of uh, the, the, the weak interactions. And in fact, uh, it actually is even involved in explaining the, the solar fusion, where actually the opposite, uh, uh, the inverse uh, happens, where a proton goes into a neutron plus a, an electron uh, and a neutrino, uh, so that uh, the deuterium can, can uh, form. And, uh, and fusion can take place. As I said, the important part is that uh, weak interactions are chiral, so they left-handed and right-handed fields, right, left-handed and right-handed fermions, uh, have different quantum numbers under SU2 and also under U1. And this would be very relevant because this is the reason, as I will explain, that you really cannot write, you put by hand a mass term for the fermions, okay? Uh, so these are the weak interactions are very different from the electromagnetic interactions that we all know from everyday experience that have uh, an infinite range and a massless photon. So the standard model, what is the situation? The standard model, as we say, is a, a, a quantum uh, gauge theory uh, that has to respect the gauge invariant of this uh, of this symmetry group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Okay. Uh, what this means, this gauge invariance, is that it forbids to write terms uh, for uh, this called generically the gauge bosons, let's call it this V mu. So uh, we cannot write a term uh, for the theory uh, that uh, without breaking this gauge invariance of the, of the field. However, we can write terms for any scalar field or any uh, fermion field. Uh, and we can do that only if left and right properties are the same. But I just told you that in the standard model, the left fields and the right fields behave differently vis-a-vis -vis the weak interactions. Okay? So, um, what we see here now in the standard model, what experience tells us is that gluons and photons are massless, at least very first uh, for the gluons as well, so which means that we are fine because uh, we cannot really write a mass for these guys, but we don't need to write a mass for these guys. However, as I showed you before, two seconds ago, for the weak interactions that are short range, we really need to have mass for the force carriers of the weak interactions. And the force carriers of the weak interactions are the Z and the W bosons, and these are massive. So there is a problem here, okay? And then the fermions are uh, also massive, and in principle we could write this type of term where this is a left-handed fermion and a right-handed fermion and their mission conjugate, so I could just put these terms in my theory, but I cannot do that because, as we said, uh, the fermions in the standard model are chiral. Do not, uh, this, this would break gauge invariance because they have different quantum numbers, okay? So uh, the weak gauge bosons and the matter fields, in principle, should be massless, and this clearly contradict experience okay, of our world. So the point is what causes uh, these fundamental particles to have mass? So what causes these particles to have mass is actually a field of energy that permeates all of the space. Okay? And uh, in reality, this is an invisible uh, force field. And uh, uh, we are... Um, we are used to invisible force fields, and the one that we come to my mind is the uh, Earth magnetic field. Uh, the Earth magnetic field uh, is sourced by the Earth itself, and it permeates all the space nearby. And we don't see it, but anyone who gets a compass knows that the Earth magnetic field is there. Correct? Uh, the, the Higgs field, which is here, I hope you see it. Do you see it? <laughs> um, uh, is different. Uh, so the, 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 the Earth magnetic field has a, a, a direction, okay, a well-defined direction, and a source. The source is the Earth itself, correct. The, the Higgs field uh, has no direction. It permeates the whole space and doesn't need any source because the source is itself, okay? So, um, so this is the big difference between the two, but they're both invisible force fields, okay? 
I'm coming in a sec. Yes, yes. This is just the, the intro. <laughs> so, um, correct. So, what does it mean? What, 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 I'm, what is important, correct? I mean, you don't see it there, but I'm telling you the Higgs field is there. So what, what turns it on? What makes it uh, active? Oh, God. OK. Uh, I hope it appears. Uh, so the Higgs field is actually, ah, OK, it's actually self-sourcing. And what I mean with that is that it interacts with itself. And what I mean with that is that I can write a potential, that is what I wrote here, but this has a quadratic term and a quartic term. So this, this, uh, this potential means that the Higgs field interacts, interacts with itself, OK? And what happens is that uh, what describes um, the, the, the Higgs potential, that is what is written here, is really what describes the energetics of turning on this Higgs field, OK? When this Higgs field is turned off, uh, basically uh, means that um, we are uh, at, a, at a situation where we have a symmetric, uh, a symmetric um, um, state in the theory. And so um, what happens is that as the universe cools down, okay, at the beginning the, the, the Higgs field doesn't realize basically that there is this kind of potential and, and it's more uh, energetically favorable to be at a lower value than at a higher value. And this is a symmetric situation. Of course, this is also a symmetric situation, but has uh, uh, degenerate uh, uh, vacua. And so what happens is that as the universe cools down, then the, the Higgs field uh, starts seeing this potential. And uh, what occurs is uh, what is called the process of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? What means is that for the Higgs field, is, uh, uh, is energetically better to be in this lower uh, uh, energy state. And at some point, it goes to a definite value of this infinite degenerate vacua. Okay? And once I picked a value, it's very hard to, trans to do a transition to any other vacua of this. So this is the idea of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? And what it means really is that um, in terms of, of the system, that there is a symmetry uh, of the system that the whole system uh, 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 respects, but is not respected by the vacuum, by the vacuum of, the, of the theory. Okay? So the whole Lagrangian that terms has a symmetry, as we were saying, the standard model has a symmetry, but the vacuum of the theory does not respect that symmetry. And that's what happens when it's spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? So, how did people start thinking about this? Um, uh, so the idea uh, really was a, a very interesting, um, uh, so a spontaneous symmetry breaking for what um, Nambu got the 2008 Nobel Prize uh, is actually um, a, a, a case of, he calls it, of cross fertilization because the idea really came uh, from condensed matter, okay? so it's a, it's a, a concept that came, or an idea that came, all these people, this is Goldstone and this is Nambu, they were working and thinking about condensed matter problems, and they came about to think about ideas in particle physics. But in condensed matter, you have some media, okay, that, that is your, your solid, okay. Uh, in, in particle physics, what Nambu uh, translate is that the, the quantum vacuum is actually the medium, okay. And so there was a problem there because uh, when you do this spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, we were saying, for example, that we are going to break in this, this Mexican hat, okay? This is a, a U1 version with a complex field, okay? The real standard model is uh, this SU2 cross U1, so it's more complex, but I don't have way to uh, dra draw this, uh, this uh, uh, would be a five-dimensional space because it would be a, uh, uh, two complex fields. Uh, so, so what happens then is that when this symmetry breaking occurs, um, Goldstone, so they are, they are basically 
uh, a symmetry group has some generators of the of the of the symmetry, and what happens really is that when uh, symmetry spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs, uh, there appear massless bosons that are called Goldstone bosons, and this was what uh, uh, Goldstone theorem that says that spontaneous symmetry breaking implies the existence of massless Goldstone bosons, and in fact, in more mathematical terms, you can show that for every broken generator of the symmetry, you would have one Goldstone boson. Okay? Uh, this, of course, was a problem because there were no Goldstone bosons, no massless particles, no massless bosons that were seen. Okay? So that was a problem at the moment. But then uh, Anderson was looking, of course, at condensed matter and, uh, and was looking at different physical systems. And he looked at ferromagnetism, and crystals, and finally, this, this actually, there are, uh, there are broken symmetries there. And these broken symmetries are associated with spin waves or phonons that are actually the, the massless goldstones. Okay? But that came superconductivity, and uh, in superconductivity, the problem was there was no goldstone boson, no massless boson. Okay? And so uh, this is the idea of Anderson, and I, I translate uh, a bit what he said, but I can read what he said. Okay? And in fact, uh, I have it here. I think it's, well, I don't know if I can read it all together, but he wrote in his paper, um, it is likely uh, then that considering a superconducting an analog, uh, that the way is now open for the degenerate vacuum theory of the Nambu type without any difficulties involving zero mass Jan Mills gauge bosons or zero mass Goldstone bosons. So these two types of bosons, he said, seem capable of cancelling each other and leaving finite mass bosons only. So this was really in the original paper, and the way I translate it for you is that the gauge bosons eat the Goldstone bosons and get mass, just like a photon inside a superconductor. Okay? What happens really in the superconductor, you form the Cooper pairs, okay? uh, E minus E minus form a condensate, okay? and that really dynamically uh, breaks the U1 electromagnetic, and uh, this is, would be like the Higgs uh, field okay? that condensates. And then you form, uh, you give mass to the photons inside the conductor. And I think that would be what is usually called plasmons. So this idea was there. And in fact, uh, and in fact, I don't know what I'm doing now because it's not, not going up or going down. OK, one second. OK, good. So and in fact, um, uh, along came uh, Braut, Engert, and Braut, Engert, and Higgs. I have to tell you this because it was very funny. I was looking this, uh, this uh, pic I was making this transparency, and my 12-year-old son comes on top of me, uh, on my back, sorry, and says, "Mom, is Braut the guy that is dead, and therefore you put it in black and white?" And, and then I realized that if you start looking there, everybody who is alive is in color, and everybody who is dead <laughs> is in black and white. But I did not do that on purpose, but it came that way. And all through my talk, if you want to know if a guy is dead or alive, you just look at the color. I think Goldstone is dead, no? No! Oh my God! I killed him! Oh! Nambu is also alive, I think. Yes. Well, eh, no, okay, let's go. I didn't look at this one. From now on. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yes, of course. You know, when, we, when one gets older, these things happen. No, because he told me this looking at this okay. gentleman. So from there on, you can now look, please. And, if you, if you decide, if you find an obvious mistake in my talk like this one, please let me know. <laughs> like someone is alive and I call it dead, him dead. Anyway, so yeah, from here on, this is true, I think. Um, I will tell him that I was wrong. So anyway, going back to physics. Um, so the, the Braut and Glert uh, Higgs mechanism um, exactly is the relativistic version of what Anderson saw in super, to explain superconductivity. Okay? Um, so uh, what happens is that there is a fundamental scalar field with self-interactions, that the self-interactions are the ones that actually um, make the, the, the turn on the, 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 the field itself. And uh, um, 
this causes, this self-interaction causes the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the vacuum without picking any preferred frame or direction, okay, and can give mass to the gauge bosons. And in what, what happens is that, um, I, what happens in the standard model is that instead of having a, 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 a singlet, uh, uh, a complex singlet as I show you in my Mexican hat, what I really have, what I really need is a complex doublet, so there are four degrees of freedom, okay, and from these four degrees of freedom, uh, three of these degrees of freedom that are the would-be Goldstone bosons, okay, are eaten by the W and the C, which means that uh, are transformed in the um, longitudinal components, okay, of the W and the C, so that they become massive, and there is one uh, particle uh, that is left in the spectrum, and this is the Higgs, and the reason it's called the Higgs is because, uh, in fact, Higgs was the first one that uh, pointed towards the fact that there was, as a, a byproduct of this Higgs, sorry, of this broad angled Higgs mechanism, there was a, a, a particle left as a uh, physical degree of freedom in the spectrum, okay, and this is uh, the Higgs boson. So, um, the heavier particles interact more with the Higgs, as we will see, um, because uh, the interactions are just proportional to mass. Okay. Um, so, um, a few years later, uh, this is okay. Is it? Yes. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> now, I'm wor now I'm worried. Yes, because I did it after the after the three the three pictures. Sorry, I didn't. Now I went back because you made me go back. Okay, so the standard model of particle physics or the electroweak part of the standard model of particle physics means that we start with an SU two left cross U one non abelian gauge theory uh, with chiral fermions, and this is uh, spontaneously broken to a U one electromagnetic. This has uh, four generators and three of these generators uh, when uh, the spontaneous, so what happens basically is that the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, occurs and by Goldstone theorem we will have the three um, massless Goldstone, but Goldstone theorem was done in a theory without gauge fields, okay? Once you put the gauge fields, okay, and you, you are uh, uh, arranged to have gauge invariance, then what happens is that these Goldstone modes are the ones that are uh, transforming into longitudinal components of uh, the, the gauge bosons that are associated with these um, uh, gener generators of what is broken. So in this particular case, I have four generators here, three of them uh, are broken, so to say, to, and, and only one is left intact, that is U1 electromagnetic, uh, and so um, that's why uh, the photon remains massless, instead the W and the Z acquire mass. You need to add glacial in colors, because the group was Actually, I had, a, I had a nice, in another version of my talk, I had a nice, very nice um, um, Nobel Prize uh, picture, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't find it, so, but I, 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 I will put it, actually. I have it somewhere. I will put it for my next time. Perhaps one should also point out that the necessity of the, of the scalar in the leftover scalar is not really a, a strong consequence of the mechanism. No. I mean, in this realization, of course. The yeah, we were talking about that today, actually. Uh, that uh, in, in this, but, uh, but in some way, there, right? would you agree with me that, yeah, I do the analogous, okay? So if you see supersymmetry at LHC, string people would be very happy because yeah. it goes in the right direction. This is the same thing. If you see the Higgs, it goes in the mechanism that has been produced no, within no, the standard no, model for SU2 no, cross U1. No, no. Could be, could be that you only have the goldstones, correct? Yeah, that's right. Correct. Or well, some right. technical, yeah. some technical. Correct. Yeah, you do, you do that many times. In composite Higgs models, you have that many times, correct? Yeah, it's perfectly okay. Yes, correct. In fact, that's what Anderson had. He didn't have radial modes, so that's See, why. No, that's why no, he, Higgs he, gets Nobel Prize. <laughs> He did not, but okay, yeah, I was thinking about that because he has the condensate, correct? That is break dynamical. The, the, the right. Cooper pair breaks dynamical. But the he, he didn't study the fluctuation of radial mode, I don't think so. No, well, there are actually some articles that are. 
the, the point is that, uh, well, I don't want, maybe we talk over dinner, because I, I want to tell you something sure. about that, but I don't want to get so off track, otherwise, I don't know about the timing, but I'm already doing bad, for sure. Uh, okay, so, as I say, three of the four, so this is, a, we have a complex doublet scalar field with four real components and self-interactions of the same type, so, of, of the ones that I was showing you there, correct? The, this one, but instead of being, now this is a, a doublet, um, complex field, same type of interactions, and uh, uh -oh. uh, and so um, three of the four scalar components are eaten to give mass to W plus, W minus, and C, and they leave the neutral Higgs boson and the massless photon, because the massless photon is related to the fact that uh, this U1 electromagnetic is not broken. Okay, so there's one massless photon. Uh, so that's an acquired mass, correct? So um, the, the fermions, in fact, uh, the fermions uh, are not directly related to that, but by, by interacting, uh, because I, now I can have the quantum numbers of the Higgs such that, okay, I can write terms of this type, okay, but I should have put this before, uh, I can write terms of this type, but where here I have the Higgs field. And when the Higgs field acquires a vacuum expectation value, it generates a mass for the fermions. Okay, these are the type of Yukawa interactions. So it's a new type of interaction that give mass to the fermions. Okay. So I should write that actually to be more clear. Uh, okay. So so far so good about the Higgs mechanism. Any questions? No. Super clear. Okay. So how do we search for the Higgs? Uh, well. Uh, as my son would say, smashing particles. So smashing particles as high energy accelerators uh, to create the Higgs, okay? So as we all know, E equal mc squared, energy is mass. In this case, is kinetic energy that is going to be transformed into mass, okay? But we do is we are colliding two protons and, and creating uh, the Higgs. And the way we sh look for the Higgs is by looking at uh, the, the Higgs is created and Im almost immediately decays into the particles that I show you for the standard model. So in reality, our detectors are looking for the standard model particles that we know. However, you should ask me, okay, how it comes, correct, that uh, I am crushing two protons that are really made by uh, up and down quarks and, and gluons, okay, and I'm creating something that is totally different and much heavier, okay. When you did, do a public lecture, you said if you crash two cars, you don't expect to get a, a, um, a track, correct? And in the real world, that is true, okay, but um, in, in the quantum world, that is not true, and uh, what happens has to do uh, with the uncertainty principle, I mean, and here, um, so this is the classical model of atoms, but in reality, uh, what we know is that the electrons, uh, all what we can measure is the probability of the electron being somewhere uh, close to the nucleus, okay? And I like this one, this is, the I, this is a silly thing, but I like it. So this is the probability of the electron being somewhere in the nucleus. Um, so, in reality, is an element of chance in the macroscopic world that allow, allow us to create the Higgs at colliders, okay? And so, uh, sorry, I don't know, this is coming totally funny, sorry. Um, so what is exciting is that we realize that the nothingness uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the vacuum, of the quantum vacuum, is the most exciting thing because in the other version of the uncertainty principle, that means that we can create by quantum fluctuations and a pair of particles that they, and annihilate them. So they basically are, uh, we are kind of sharing uh, energy from the vacuum and creating these virtual particles that we call, uh, and, and they, they, they are created and they are um, uh, annihilated in the vacuum. So at, at huge particle accelerators, we have these virtual particles that are created in quantum vacuum, uh, to the whole reaction we are going to add a lot of energy, okay? And all together this is going to produce uh, new particles that were not there before. 
So in this sense, quantum fluctuations are the reason why we can produce the Higgs at LHC. Okay? And a way to see that is just, this is about the decay, I should have put one about the production, but the point is that virtual particles are what facilitate the Higgs discovery because the photon propagates in quantum vacuum and creates virtual tops, okay, which means they are what we call is an off shell, which means the top quark is 172 GV, which is the, the distribution uh, peaks at 172 GV, and this is what we call the mass of the top, correct? But in reality, be, because we have uh, delta E times delta T uh, equal the Planck constant, uh, the top quark can be off shell, can have a mass different from its mass. And this is what happens here. And usually I didn't put it here, but it's, it's a thought with a star, means this off shell. So now the, the, the photon propagates in quantum vacuum. And, and, and generates this uh, virtual top, and the Higgs interacts very strongly with the top because the top is very heavy, okay? And we said that the Higgs interacts with particles proportional to their mass. So it's very light interactions with the electrons and up the, and down quarks that are inside the proton, but very strongly interacting with the top quark, the W and the Z, okay? And the same, the Higgs decay into four leptons. The Higgs we know now is 125 GV or 125.5 GV or so. The Z bosons are 91 GV, so it's clear that we are not generating on shell with the full mass, these Z bosons. So what we generate is uh, some off shell uh, Z boson, and then this decays into leptons. And what we look at the collider is these four leptons. Okay? So the standard model at the LHC, the production processes, are all through virtual particles. So the gluons interact with the top, but not directly with the Higgs because the gluons are massless. However, because of the strong interactions, in fact, the production cross section, this is, uh, well, one picobarm is uh, uh, 10 to the uh, minus 36 centimeter square. So um, this is of the order of, uh, for 125, of the order of, uh, I don't know, 30, 20 something picobarms. Uh, so this is the biggest cross-section, I should have put the line there at 125, the mass of the Higgs, the biggest production mode of Higgses at, uh, at LHC, and the next one is what we call vector boson fusion, that is here, okay, and then comes this, that is uh, uh, W and C Higgses stralun, and this is the lower one is TT bar. Of course, these are all important because we are testing different couplings. For example, here we are testing the coupling of the Higgs to the gauge bosons, okay, and here we are testing the coupling of the Higgs to the top, okay? And then um, there is the decays, okay? And the Higgs decay, again, they are to consider numbers of degrees of freedom and uh, the, the, the fact that you have to have a sufficient kinetic energy to produce the particle, and you have also the, 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 the coupling of the Higgs to that particle. So, uh, as Fabiola Gianotti uh, said the day of the Higgs discovery, we have been very lucky that the Higgs decided to be a 125 GV. This is the branching ratio, means the probability that the Higgs, uh, the likelihood that the Higgs decays or goes into a given set of, into a given group particles, okay? So for example, if I am here, the branching ratio one mean, would, would mean that the Higgs decays 100% of the time to BB bar, but this is not exactly. So what happens here is that the Higgs in, for 125 GV, okay, has a lot of open decays, which is very nice because we can, we can explore now the, the interactions of the Higgs with all the, ma many of the particles of the standard model, okay? Uh, in fact, the Higgs decays to BB bar mainly, to WW, that is this green line, to ZZ, that is the blue line, okay? Also the case to taus and to gluons, the reason I'm not putting it here is because uh, these are the K-MOS that are very hard uh, to see in the background of all the other particles produced at LHC. Uh, instead, for example, the Higgs decay to gamma gamma, again, the Higgs does not couple to photons because photons are massless, but couples to the photons through the top quark, virtual top quark as I said. And so, um, although the branching ratio is very small, okay, is, 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 uh, is less than, than a percent there, um, th it is very important because it's a very uh, clean, uh, it's very easy to detect the, the, the photons uh, at the LHC, okay? So, uh, this, is, uh, the, this channel is interesting 
but is uh, hard for background, the main discovery channels, uh, the first discovery channels of LHC has been Higgs 2 ZZ and Higgs 2 Gamma Gamma. So, um, oh, okay. So I am in one third of my talk, so probably I will just show you one uh, situation and I will move. Uh, I have very nice candidate events. So this is a, a candidate event of a Higgs to gamma gamma. We see the two photons in CMS and we search for a narrow mass peak with two isolated uh, missing ET photons on a smoothly, a smooth, smoothly falling background. And the other mode is the um, these are animations, but I think I will pass them. And is the, the golden channel, Higgs to ZZ to four leptons, and we see in this case the muons that go faster and, and the electrons, or in this case it's a decay with four muons. So these are real events. So uh, we have measured uh, the, the, the decays of, or we have measured the Higgs to have a mass in this range, okay? 125.5 uh, is the average, and we have looked at the Higgs in different modes. Of course, in BB bar, if you look uh, this, for example, at the two, this is uh, the value of the, the, the best fit to the cross section that they have measured in the Higgs going to BB bar, and you see that it's compatible with zero at two sigma. Two sigma will be twice this. Uh, so this means that really we have not yet have enough statistics to understand if the Higgs is really decaying to BB bar. Okay? So we have not proven that the Higgs couples to BB bar. We have, however, proven that the Higgs couples to tops because one of the major production is through gluon fusion. Okay? And gluon fusion only occurs in the standard model through the top loop. Okay? So um, the point is we have measured this, and now uh, goes the next part of my talk. So uh, we know that the Higgs could be then these Higgs that explain the way that particles in the all fundamental particles in nature acquire mass. Okay? And let me remind you that the Higgs is responsible for 1% of all the visible mass. Okay? Most of the mass is not the mass that is in the fundamental particles, but it's the mass like in a proton. Okay? The proton is 1 GV and, 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 and the up and down quarks are 500 MeV or so. Okay? So the main part of the, of the mass comes from uh, the, the binding energy of the strong interactions. So the point is, the Higgs boson uh, is the Higgs boson that explains the mass of the fundamental particles, or uh, is something that looks like the Higgs boson, but is something different. Okay? And so that's the main question. And the way with the tools we have to look at that is to uh, look at the production. The main tool is to look at the production and the decay rates, okay? and see really uh, if they are what we expect in the standard model. So for a standard model, we know a few things, a few facts. We know that has a spin zero. Okay? We know that is neutral, uh, so it's the neutral CP component uh, of this uh, complex SU2 doublet, so it has to be CP even. We know how it should couple to the W and the C, because in, in the structure of the standard model, uh, the way that uh, the, the Higgs couples to the W and the C is such that it couples proportional to the masses. So the ratio of this coupling should be the ratio of these masses. We know that it couples to fermion proportional to their masses, but we have not proven that because we have not seen directly how, how the Higgs couples, for example, to BB bar. And then most important, okay, I told you that the Higgs mass is 125 GV, but the Higgs mass is given in terms of the quartic coupling, this self-interacting uh, coupling, and we have not, uh, we are not able at LHC to measure this self-interacting coupling. So these are, I will not go into the detail, but so far with the two years of data uh, at LHC has been able to uh, basically test the hypothesis that the, uh, the particle that has been measured is indeed a spin zero particle. Uh, the fact that the particle is CP uh, even is highly preferred. This is, uh, uh, shows that the data is highly uh, consistent with a, with a CP even spin zero particle. And then this is measurements of couplings that I won't go into, into details, but they are being uh, scrutinized now and more data will come. And why is this important? Okay, it's because it could be that the, uh, the Higgs can be many different things and still be the Higgs that is responsible for electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? For example, it could be uh, a mixture of two Higgses. 
Okay? And that's why it's very important to look for additional Higgses. Uh, it could have a bit of CP uh, mixture. What they have proven is that it's compatible with a CP even uh, quantity, and that's for sure not only CP odd. But they have not proven if it has a mixture. There could be some composite particle. They could have different type of couplings to matter that are not the ones that we are expecting. We have not checked that. Uh, and very important, they could have, I show you the way the Higgs will decay, how we look for it, okay? But it could be that the Higgs decays into other particles that we have not seen yet. In particular, the Higgs could decay into dark matter, okay? So the goal of the uh, uh, next LHC phase is to answer these questions, okay? And uh, you would ask me, okay, why it's interesting to think that there should be some physics beyond what we just saw, okay? And I would say the, the, the Higgs is new physics, but why should be more new physics than the Higgs that we just discovered, okay? And uh, there are two ways to consider that. So why we expect new physics beyond, beyond the Higgs? Uh, in fact, I won't go into details, but for the consistency of the theory, the Higgs was necessary. But now that the Higgs is necessary, it could be that there is nothing there that we need to add to our understanding of nature, in principle. However, there is a bit of a problem. And a bit of a problem is I told you that one can have a scalar masses. One can write as, uh, in the hour Lagrangian, so one can write this term, OK? Because they are not protected by the gauge symmetries, as I told you before. And uh, the problem is that. Uh, when we go at the quantum level, these scalar masses, this variation, this scalar masses that are related to this uh, mass of the, of the Higgs, let's say, um, actually uh, know about the physics at higher scales. And this is what this formula here says, that the mass of the Higgs that I measure uh, at the electroweak scale is given as a function of the mass of the Higgs that I can measure at some other fundamental scale, lambda, and I have, uh, and it receives contributions at the quantum level of any of the other particles that interact with the Higgs, okay? And it depends logarithmically on this scale at which I know uh, as a theoretical input the mass of the Higgs and the scale uh, at which I'm measuring the Higgs mass. So this is, of course, a logarithm of scales. So even if it is this, this, this uh, lambda is very heavy, that's not very important. But, of course, this uh, tells me that the Higgs uh, for example, would go like the top quark mass square. Of course, if I have here the top quark mass square that was, is 172 GB, and I have to compare it with the Higgs mass that is 125 GB, that's okay. There's not much of a problem. But instead, what happens is that if I have here a mass of a particle that is, let's say, 10 to the 16 GB, okay, then I would have something that is 10 to the 16 GB here, and I would have to have a good cancellation between whatever is this value of the Higgs at the UV, at the ultraviolet, in order to get a mass that is much smaller, okay? And the way to say this is that although the standard model with the Higgs is a consistent theory, light scalars like the Higgs boson cannot survive in the presence of very heavy states. And we think that, in principle, at least at the Planck scale, there should be something else there. So it could be that it's at the gut scale, it could be somewhere, but as soon as I have here some new particles, okay, then I will have what is called usually the fine tuning or the hierarchy problem. Okay, so the Higgs, as any like, we don't have any other light scalars in the standard model, correct? We don't have any other, this is the first time we see a scalar. And the, the idea is the scalars really cannot survive if there are other heavy guys somewhere. As you see here, this is, uh, depends on the spin, so it's, a, it's a, uh, a minus for fermions and a plus for bosons. And so the, the is a, uh, it's a spin dependent. And so, uh, but what this tells me is that there are new particles anywhere at the gut scale, at the string scale, or at the Planck scale. Uh, this will make a problem for the Higgs mass. That is the only scalar that we have seen in nature. So it's the first time that we have this problem. The existence of the Higgs creates the problem. There are two possible solutions. One is the idea that there is some symmetry, some extended symmetry in nature that uh, relates bosons to fermions. And that's very easy to see because if there are bosons and fermions, well, we are, we are going to do all that. So this is one option, that there is a symmetry that relates bosons and fermions. 
The other one is that the Higgs that we see as an scalar, in reality, is a composite field, not a fundamental field. And above a certain scale, that scalar does not exist at all. And this is another line of thought that has to do with what we call composite Higgs models. Okay? And today I was going to talk about both, but now I will barely talk about this, this, the, the supersymmetry. So both, what is important for us is that how we test which of these theories is right. Well, both options have will change the way the, fix, the Higgs behaves. Okay? We have discovered the Higgs. Now we need to understand very well the properties of the Higgs to know which of these two options could be the solution uh, of the problem. And of course, these two options will come with different type of particles that we can look for at LHC. And this is really the next step for LHC. So in supersymmetry, I will go not very, uh, the, the issue is that now I have all the standard model particles and I have all the supersymmetric particles. As I said, for every fermion of the standard model, fermion of the standard model, there is a boson and we call it very uh, elegantly super up quark or up or super top or stop, okay? Stop is a nice name. And uh, for the gauge bosons, they are going to be uh, what we call gaichinos, that are fermions. And for the Higgs, in fact, there are going to be more than one Higgs. For the Higgs, there are going to be a fermion that is a Higgsino. So for every fermion, there is a boson. And the important part is that if supersymmetry is exact, they have equal mass and couplings. Well, if they have equal mass and couplings, I show you this formula, okay? And if I put any number of uh, uh, other theories, other uh, particles, sorry, but for every fermion, I put a boson with Actually, this is the coupling of this fermion to the Higgs, and this is the coupling of this boson to the Higgs. With, um, with the same uh, coupling to the Higgs, then you see right away that this goes to zero. Correct? So this is really what happens in supersymmetry. In supersymmetry, this goes to zero. However, unfortunately, uh, LHC, has, as my husband looks to make a joke about, um, Kyle has not worked hard enough and has not discovered supersymmetry yet. Is that true? So I, my, my husband says, experimentalists are being totally incompetent. <laughs> I have not, discovered, have not discovered supersymmetry when we know perfectly well that it's there. And he's working on it, right? He's working on I don't know. He was dancing, so I don't know. Anyway, the point is okay, that in supersymmetry, this cancellation is automatic. But we know that supersymmetry has not been discovered yet at LHC. Okay? And what this means is that there is some difference between the super partner, let's say the top, and the stop. Because if they would have equal mass, I would have seen it. Okay? In particular, there are other like selectrons and, and other other of the squarks. Okay. So this difference is between let's say the top and the stop. Okay? And this difference is what we call of the order of the supersymmetry breaking parameter. So we, are, we need to break supersymmetry. Um, we call it softly. Uh, but that means that we are co going to, change, to, to, to give a mass, different mass, to the standard model fermion than to the uh, bosonic supersymmetric partner. But we are going to keep the re same uh, relation between the couplings. Okay, and this is what we call soft supersymmetry breaking. So, as in, in why I'm talking about the top so much? Well, because of the Yukawa, correct? The, the top is the one that couples more strongly to the Higgs, and therefore the top is the one that is most relevant in this game. So we are looking very much for the stop, for the stop, because if we want to solve this problem of uh, naturalness, we need to have a stop that is not uh, much above maybe a few or ten TV. And that how much fine tuning is a question of taste. So this is, a, this is the idea why we thought about supersymmetry. And most important, why we think that supersymmetry should be at LHC rich. Okay? But there are other reasons why, besides this, why we think that new physics could be good. And it's because the standard model has problem explaining all these issues. The stand, explaining dark matter, the matter-antimatter asymmetry, uh, the origin of the neutrino masses, 
the origin of the actual process of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, because I didn't tell you, but in reality, in order to have a spontaneous symmetry breaking in the standard model, by hand, I have to put a negative square mass parameter in the potential. Okay, and the idea is that in supersymmetry, you could make that happen dynamically through quantum corrections. Okay. Um, the issue of unification of forces uh, is also something. So supersymmetry can address some of these questions, can give a nice dark matter candidate, can have a solution for the matter-antimatter symmetry, can have a good solution for dynamic electronic symmetry breaking. Um, so back to, the, back to the Higgs, the basics that we want to understand is, are the Higgs couplings to matter particles proportional to their masses? Uh, does the Higgs talk to particles that we have not seen? Okay, does it decay to dark matter? Does it decay to other particles? Or does it interact with other particles? This is, you know, we have discovered the Higgs, now we want to get the most out of it to understand what is the theory that is solving all these puzzles, all these mysteries of matter uh, that we have. And, uh, and of course, as I said, very important, are there other Higgs bosons? How many Higgs bosons are there? We just found one, okay? Could be that there are more and that they share their job, okay, in giving mass to the particles. And then there are the big questions that the point is now we have found the Higgs. Are these big questions of, uh, of uh, uh, particle physics related in some ways to the Higgs? And in that way, is, is there a Higgs portal to dark matter? Does the Higgs talk to dark matter? Okay. Uh, does the Higgs trigger this genesis of matter? So it's, it's, it's related to matter, and I will go to that uh, in what? Uh, okay. Five minutes? Five minutes? Oh, God. I won't go. Okay. And does the Higgs make the universe unstable? And I underestimate my time badly. Or I'm too relaxed, I don't know. Okay, so what we have measured the Higgs. We, we know that the mass is 125 GB with some error, plus minus one or so. We have three options that I showed you about before. This is the mass of the Higgs. This is the 125 GB. So if the, Higgs, if the standard model is valid to the Planck scale, the mass of the Higgs could be in principle in all this range, but it happens to be where the red line is. And interesting here is that what it is on this blue um, area here is, um, and in fact, that is over the red line, implies that we are living in a uh, unstable universe. So the, the vacuum where we are is not stable. Okay? In fact, it's metastable. So if there's nothing else besides the, what we call the standard model, then we do live in a metastable vacuum. I have good news for you because I don't have the time to tell you all about it. This metastable vacuum is very long lived about 10 to the 100 years, so we don't have to worry about our kids or great, 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 great grandchildren. But it's an interesting point, okay, that we want to understand. Is this metastability of our vacuum telling us something else or not? Okay. Uh, and this is what I try to see here. So we are here, and by analyzing the Higgs potential, we understand how this quartic coupling, the self interacting coupling, works, and it happens that it has a zero and this is related to being like here, uh, at some energy, 10 to the 10 GB or so, at some field value. And so there is another vacuum, deeper than our vacuum. And the question is, you know, are we tunneling? What is the time that will take us to tunnel to the other vacuum that will destroy our universe, of course? And as I said, the good news is because this evolves so slow, is that the electroweak vacuum is safe from early collapse. So you don't have to panic. Uh, in supersymmetry, uh, we have different options. This is like what we call the minimal uh, extension, which means that we only add the minimal amount of particles to the standard model. Of course, you say, well, you know, this is a disaster. For every fermion uh, where you put a boson, you are doubling the, the number of particles in the standard model. Uh, but we already went through this uh, disaster once when we realized that every particle has an, an empty particle. Okay, so the only problem here is we are only we have only found half of the particles of the supersymmetric standard model. But anyway, the Higgs mass in this minimal supersymmetric standard model can be 125, 
But of course, what this tells us, okay, is that you are going to be in a very a specific region of parameter space. So we want to learn what this 125 GB mass tells us about supersymmetry. Okay? And I won't go to the composite models. So if you extend these models, you can go. But we are here. So what does it tell us? Well, the first thing that it tells us is, the first important thing is that in any supersymmetric model, because of the supersymmetric structure, uh, you need at least to have four kinds of of uh, uh, Higgs bosons, okay? You cannot live with just the Higgs we found. You need to find at least at least three more. So in the minimal model, you have one, two CP even Higgses, one CP odd, and one char Higgs. And because you have basically two Higgs doublets, you have two vacuum expectation values. Instead of having only one, you have two, and you have some parameter tangent beta that is a ratio of two. The other important thing in supersymmetry is that because of the supersymmetry structure, uh, the, the quartic couplings, the self-interacting self uh, couplings of the Higgs, instead of being free, like in the standard model, they are just given by the gauge interactions. So they are very fixed. And they are so fixed that the mass of the Higgs is directly related to the mass of the Z boson, which of course is 91 GB. So that tells you already that uh, so we are, we are lucky because there are quantum corrections to this Higgs mass, and these quantum corrections has to do with the fact that the top and the stop don't have the same mass, so they don't cancel each other, okay? So for the Higgs, the Higgs mass is telling us a lot about where could be the stop, the supersymmetric partner of the top work, okay? So the, the little Higgs, as we call it, may have standard model properties and be this 125 GB, not a square, sorry, the 125 GB. And we can have the other three Higgses, a char Higgs, a
up, I have to decide, maybe I tell this and, and two things more. So, uh, so I told you already that just knowing that the Higgs mass is 125 GB tell us something about um, the stops in supersymmetry. Um, but I also told you that the stops are not going to be a big effect in the Higgs production. I also told you that there are many ways we can do what is precision measurement. So what can Higgs precision measurement tell us? And there are many different things. I produce the Higgs, and then the Higgs goes into BB bar, or two photons, or, or two Z, Z bosons that go to four leptons, and this is the total width. And so all these three variables have information to know if the Higgs talks to other particles. Okay? And in fact, this is in the production, for example, and in the decay, I'm going to measure if the Higgs, how the Higgs talks to the top, but also I will see if there are, the Higgs talks to other particles that are also going to mediate this production. For example, if I have the stops, the stops will appear here. Okay? And so that will be uh, a piece of information. If I have, for example, charged staus that, that are connecting to the, to the diphotons, they will appear there. So, in fact, I'm going to go back to this. So, basically, I'm going to look at this uh, production and decay modes and do precision measurements because I will be able to see if there are different patterns of deviations from the production and decays of the Higgs, okay, such that I will know if there are, for example, light charge or, or light color particles that appear in these loops. It's also possible that there are modifications to the three-level coupling of the Higgs. As I said, if the Higgs is not the only Higgs responsible for mass, but there are other Higgses okay, that share the job of giving mass to the W and the C, and so these couplings would be different from what I expect. And last but not least, the Higgs